Early on in this series, I made a video on the development history of the Panther II tank. Unfortunately, at the time I wrote that video, I was unaware that one of the primary pieces of source material I used for my research had later been found to contain a mistake by the author. Although some of the information was still accurate, I do regret not catching that prior to the video going live as it did spread further misinformation about the tank. This was made even worse by the fact that the Panther II already has a ton of made-up information about it from games where it is portrayed inaccurately. For these reasons, and with new information from up-to-date source material, I've chosen to make a part 2 to the original video where we'll break down exactly what I got wrong in the first video, as well as adding more information to the story of this enigma of a tank. Throughout history, there have been countless tanks, all designed to kill. But not all have been a success. What happened to the ones that never made it, and why did they fail? My name is Konovar. Join me as we journey through time, uncovering failed projects and forgotten creations in Cursed by Design. Speaking of historical accuracy being important, today's sponsor has taken that very seriously. Warpath is a free-to-play mobile strategy game that allows you to take control of forces from the Second World War from your phone. Overall, I was very impressed by the accuracy of the in-game tank models as well as the information given about them, and I hope they continue to work at this since it's something I would never expect from a mobile game. This also extends to the new Air Force portion of the game they're adding in a major update this month. Air Power was a major player in the Second World War, as I'll be discussing a little bit later in the video, so having the ability to control these important pieces of technology will no doubt help in whatever battles you face. Another really cool part of the game is the fact that you can get Jean-Claude Van Damme as one of the exclusive commanders. I'm a massive fan of integrations like this that bring real-world figures into games, especially when they're actors from 80s and 90s action movies. I highly recommend giving the game a try for yourself, and if you do so using the link in my description, along with the code AIRFORCE2021, you'll get 200 gold, 100,000 in-game cash, oil, and steel, as well as an Air Force experience book to boost your progress just for being one of my viewers. Now let's get into the main topic of today's video. It seems logical to start off by explaining exactly what I got wrong in the first video before we get into correcting the record. As I mentioned in the intro, much of my information had come from a single source, that being the book Panther and Its Variants by Walter J. Spielberger. In this book, he claims that the Panther II was planned to mount a version of the Tiger II's 88mm and that this was done using the Schmalterm turret from the Panther F program. The issue here is that the Panther with an 88mm is a separate program entirely, and a mix-up with documents led to him making this error. Unfortunately, the other sources I used for my original video did not directly contradict any of this, so I had no reason to doubt it at the time. Before you blame Mr. Spielberger for causing so much confusion though, allow me to read a small portion from Panzer Tracks 5-4 which explains what happened. The confusion in the identity and evolution of these two Panther projects, referring to the Panther II and Panther 88, in post-war histories was created by misinterpreting a single sentence in an original document. A report dated 10th February 1943 stated that experience on the Eastern Front has shown that the Panther did not have sufficiently thick armor. Knowing that Panthers hadn't been in combat on the Eastern Front until July 1943, our friend and mentor Walter Spielberger thought that this document had been misdated and should be from 1944. Not being in possession of several key documents found later, he chronologically positioned the Panther II project as being active much later in early 1945. This eventually led to an erroneous supposition that linked the project for mounting an 8.8cm KWK L71 in a small term with the Panther II chassis project. As the new data was found, Walter Spielberger corrected these misconceptions in the 1999 edition of his book Der Panzerkampfwagen Panther und Sein Arbeiten Band 9. As you can see, a minor error being made due to an assumption has led to a mountain of misinformation developing, however this was not done maliciously and was an honest mistake which was later corrected. The error on my part is far less excusable as I should have done more to fact check what I was using for my information as it is now available in the source books I will be using for this video. Obviously I will likely continue to make minor mistakes as I continue with future videos because I'm only human and it's bound to happen, but I strive to eliminate as many of them as possible, so I apologize for something so inexcusable happening and I encourage you all to check the sources I list in all my videos if you suspect I have made a mistake so I can ensure that my videos are as accurate as possible. 
Now that we've gotten through what went wrong with the first video though, let's dig into what exactly the Panther II was. The original Panther program began in late 1941 following the German invasion of the Soviet Union. This was started due in no small part to the impact of the Soviet T-34 and KV tanks. This would culminate in the first production version of the Panther, known as the Panther D, leaving the factory in early 1943. However, even prior to this, there were already concerns brewing that the armor of the tank was insufficient for the Eastern Front. This is where the Panther II enters our story. The conception of the Panther II can be said to have occurred during a conference on the 3rd of January 1943 where Hitler approved a proposal to create a new model of the Panther with 100mm of frontal armor and 60mm of side armor. With the pressing need for tanks on the Eastern Front, this would not stop the current Panthers from being sent into the field or stop production, but the Panther II would eventually replace them. At this stage in development, the only improvement was to be the increased armor with the rest of the tank being identical. However, this would later change as the shortcomings of the Panther became more and more clear. As you no doubt are aware, the Panther, especially in its early versions, was horrifically unreliable, with many parts of the drivetrain being prone to catastrophic failure. Although its armament was better than just about anything on the battlefield, that meant very little if the tank could barely limp between positions and it was eventually decided to redesign the tank entirely. Part of this redesign would incorporate components from the Tiger tank, such as the steering gear and the Panther's Achilles heel, the final drives. This does raise the question of why this wasn't done from the start with the Panther program, but that's a topic best kept for its own video. One interesting thing to note is that this was all done even before the Panther would even see combat, showing just how rushed this tank was. At this point in our story, the Tiger II makes its appearance. Known at the time as the Tiger III, it was decided that the two designs should be standardized. For those not familiar with the term, it essentially would mean that components from the two tanks would be interchangeable, or at least as many as possible would be. This was an idea the Germans tried to implement often during this point of the war with programs like the E-Series, but one that they never quite managed to implement. In the case of the Panther II and Tiger, this meant both were planned to utilize the Zahnradfabrik Friedrichshafen AK7200 transmission, Maybach HL230 engine, and the same road wheels with the Panther using 7 per side and the Tiger using 9. It was also planned to use the combat tracks from the Panther II as transport tracks for the bigger Tiger. This would lead to issues down the road though as the designers ran into issues when trying to incorporate the Tiger components into the Panther hull. The entire explanation is a bit too wordy and complex for me to go into full detail on here, but I'll try to simplify it. Essentially, it was found that both designs could use the exact same drivetrain, but this would require a redesign to the Panther's hull due to the different axle widths for the final drives and the different turning speeds of the drive shafts coming from the steering units. This was predicted to cause a drop in production, resulting in the Panther II being delayed while the Tiger II was accepted for mass production. During this period, there was also work being done on designing a turret for the Panther II, with plans for a narrow mantlet model eventually being created by Rhein Mattel Borsig in November of 1943. This is where much of the confusion between the Schmalterm turret and the Panther II stems from, as the turret was very similar in overall shape. However, no turret was ever actually decided on for the vehicle, and none were ever completed for it. One turret was eventually mounted to the tank, but we'll talk more about that and the further confusion caused by it later in the video. Production of the Panther II was planned to start by September of 1943 without any experimental vehicles. This was to start with the assembly firm DMAG who would jump straight into production of the Panther II rather than starting on the standard Panther. By the end of 1944, it was anticipated that all manufacturers would transition into Panther II production as well with the original Panther ending its production cycle in 1944. Not long after this though, things would take a drastic turn for the worse in both the German war plan as well as the Panther II's development. Development of the Panther II would still continue, however interest began to diminish for various reasons. One of the main causes of this was the introduction of Schertzen on the side of the Panthers. The primary concern with the Panther's production as I talked about in the original video I made on this topic was the threat of Soviet 14.5mm anti-tank rifles. These were found to be capable of punching through the side armor of the Panthers which was only 40mm, however the addition of these side panels was not only effective at stopping the rounds but also much cheaper than a whole new tank. The Panther II's future now hinged on a knife's edge with the focus now becoming if the Panther I could use the improved road wheels. 
The original wheels had used large amounts of rubber for their production, and by this point, Germany was already beginning to feel the pressure as resources began to become more scarce. This scarcity was only increased as the Allied bombing raids began to hit German factories harder and harder as the war dragged on. If the current generation of Panthers could not be made to use these new wheels, then the Panther II might still see production. As we know from history though, the production of the Panther II was not started and the Panther I would see construction up until the end of the war. So what resulted from the entire program? Was it just a complete waste of time and resources? MAN, the company behind the Panther, reportedly stated that two experimental Panther IIs were eventually ordered with only one of these actually being produced. They also state that it may have been employed in combat, but I find that hard to believe considering what happened later. As for the man hours spent in the engineering room for this tank, improvements were made to the production Panthers using experience gained from the Panther II design process. Although testing may have continued with the single prototype hull, production was to continue with the original Panther instead, and the Panther II was essentially shelved by mid-1943. As I alluded to earlier, there is a bit more to the story of this vehicle. Although no turret was ever produced for the tank, one was eventually fitted to it. Contrary to what many, including myself, may have thought though, this was not done by the Germans. The prototype of the Panther II was eventually captured by the American forces as they pushed into Germany later in the war, with it reportedly being found with no turret. What the tank did have at the time of capture and when it arrived back at Aberdeen for testing were test weight rings which were meant to simulate the weight of a turret. It's entirely possible that what followed is either due to the Americans not having the documents for what exactly it was that they had, or just because they wanted to recreate what the final tank would have resembled as best they could. Either of these are plausible in my opinion, but I have yet to see any documentation regarding what occurred, so I'm just guessing. Regardless of the reasoning, the Panther II was fitted with the turret from a captured Panther G. My source does not mention any findings from these tests, however the tank was eventually loaned to the Patton Museum in Fort Knox where the turret armor shell was swapped to one from a different Panther G, along with the tank being restored using parts from a donor Panther G. It remained there for a number of years until recently when it was moved to Fort Benning in 2010. The tank has since been moved into the new facility there alongside many other German tanks that survived the scrapyard. So as you can see, the tale of the Panther II is one with many twists and turns caused by missing information. Although the tank did help the Germans with improvements to later Panther variants, it never resulted in its own lineage. It does serve as a perfect example of what can happen from assumptions and lack of information though. We should never forget that history as we know it is based on the evidence we have and does not always perfectly represent the exact way things occurred. No, I'm not saying that history as we know it is wrong, because that would just be silly, but it's just something to keep in mind if you ever see something that challenges what you thought you knew. If you enjoyed the video, I recommend following this video up with the video I made on the Panther F. Special thanks to my Conley fans for supporting this channel, and to Warpath for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to use that link in the description and my code AIRFORCE2021 to get all that free stuff when you do. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.